Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. Our guest, John Gordon, is Vice President of Marketing and Strategy for IBM's Watson Solutions Division. He is responsible for developing the end-to-end -end business model needed to transform the innovations created by IBM Watson into a strategic set of industry solutions. John's focus areas include solution prioritization, value creation and value capture, business development for solution content and requirements management for the Watson core technology. Prior to this role, Mr. Gordon held a number of executive strategy, market management, and business development positions within IBM. Most recently, he was the director of strategy and market management for IBM's Global Smarter Cities Initiative. In that capacity, he led IBM's efforts to work with city leaders around the world in defining and executing on a vision to improve the quality of urban life by leveraging the capabilities of a smarter planet. John was responsible for the end-to-end -end Smarter Cities mission, including market insight, strategy generation, solutions priorities, client engagement, and market development. Previously, Mr. Gordon was director of the business partner marketing for IBM Software Group. In this capacity, he worked with more than 40,000 IBM business partners around the world to promote innovative business solutions, leveraging IBM and business partner assets. Mr. Gordon holds undergraduate degrees in philosophy and computer applications from the University of Notre Dame and has an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin. Additionally, he is a certified SOA architect with a foundational education in the IT infrastructure library standards and is co-author of a Harvard Business School case on value and use solution pricing. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome back to campus, John Gordon. Great. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, back from spring break. I can see it's, again, another lovely spring here in South Bend. Uh, I, I hope this session is, is just as fun as all the great stuff that you guys had, had yesterday or last week. Uh, and, I, and how many of you picked both 12 seed upsets last, last night? You guys are awesome. I had one. Did you? Yeah. You had one. Uh, I picked all the other 12 seed upsets that didn't happen. Okay, so uh, thanks for having me back. Um, what I hope to talk to you about today is, is something that I think is going to be one of the biggest trends we'll see, not just in the next 10 years, but probably for the next several decades. Um, so uh, Jim had an a interesting and excessively long bio, right, for, for me of stuff that I've done. But in, in a nutshell, what my role has always been is I have to take ideas and figure out what to, what to do with them. Um, so initially, uh, my, the last role, for example, I was in was in Smarter Cities. And so our, our group at IBM said, I think there's an opportunity to take all these things that are happening with technology and change the way, um, not just technology works, but how people live in cities, how, how, uh, how people live and work and, and play. And so I got to get involved in some really fascinating projects. Um, I was down in Rio de Janeiro working with the mayor there as they were, they'd just gone through all of those, you guys might remember, all those terrible mudslides after the summer rains that had, had happened. And they're getting ready for the Olympics and the World Cup. Um, just think about a high stress job, right? Imagine having both the Olympics and the World Cup coming to your city over a two year period, right? That's it's not a, a vacation of a job, even in Rio. Uh, so they wanted to figure out how do we start applying technology to problems like that? Or I also got to go over to um, Tokyo right after the, the major earthquake that was over there right? and figure out how do we help apply technology to rebuild in, in smarter ways. So that was, a, that was a phenomenal place to work. And when we started, it was, I think there's a promise here, but, but can we turn it into something meaningful and something that would actually uh, have an impact on, on people's lives? You, you might notice if, if any of you guys, I know some of you guys have, have interned with IBM before. Anyone work for IBM or been an intern with IBM before? few. Um, I know we had a, we had a number um, last year as well. So, so we kind of, as a, as a company, we're a little bit different. Uh, we focus on, we have three values. and We had 400,000 employees that all kind of got together and said, what is it that we care about? What makes us unique as a company? And it was innovation that matters, uh, matters to us and to the world. So we want to really do things that push, push the world forward. 
It's about uh, dedication to every client's success. So, so we're always doing things that um, you know, have never been done before. And it's how do you stay focused with people and help drive brand new innovation with someone when it's, you have no, no background to do it. So really making sure our clients are successful. And finally, trust and personal responsibility in all the relationships. You know if you're gonna try to do really innovative things and you really care about the success that your clients have, you're gonna have to have these really trusted open relationships with them so that as you um, try hard things, you run into problems, which inevitably you do. You have the relationships to move those forward. But because you do that, you find the places that push the industry forward. So what I wanna to talk to you guys about a little bit today is what I think will be the next era of computing. Um, but my hypothesis here is there have been exactly two eras in computing in the last 100 years, and that's it, right? There have been two. Each one's gone about 50 years. Each one defined a whole uh, set of, of technologies and industries and innovations that happened. And, and each one drove dramatic changes across not only how we live and work, but how industries developed. And so I'll talk a little bit about those for background. But I think we are just on the very initial cusp of the next one. You guys are coming out of this at exactly the right time because it's going to be in your time that this, isn't, this is going to be bigger than the internet coming and changing the way we communicate. This is an entirely different class of problems and issues that we can solve with a whole new type of computing. And you guys are going to be the business leaders who take this forward and make it happen. So I think this is going to be really big. I think it's going to be impactful for every one of you. And what I hope to do is share a little bit about how I see it coming and, and then I want to give you some examples so you can sort of see the tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, and, and examples of why I think it's going to keep growing and, and completely transform how we work. But for right now, you can see where it is that we're starting. So that's what I hope to do for you guys today. So let's start off. I, um, I'll talk about that era of computing and how I see that setting up and being different from the past. I'll spend some time on what the impact of this is, how this is going to change, change people's lives. I think this is going to uh, bring all kinds of people into new economies that haven't been uh, touched before. And it's going to be an important area. And then finally, what this means for all of you as leaders, as entrepreneurs, as researchers and students, well, what's the impact and opportunity there? So three errors of computing. The first error of computing, tabulation error of computing. What, what was that? We know it was a tabulation error of computing. At that time, think about computers were big counting systems, right? Um, you built a computer to do something, whether it was uh, counting inventory or machines that went by, or if it was a machine that was just in like a manufacturing plant that was processing. You had a machine, right? You could build machines, and they could do things. Um, they couldn't do anything else unless you took them apart and rebuilt them again. But they could do stuff, right? And we had that for a long time. In fact, we still have tons of machines like that running factories. Uh, wh what's the problem with that? It's really hard to change, right? You can do exactly one thing. Um, you know, IBM built a lot. It came from being a tabulation and reporting company. IBM is now over 100 years old. So when we started, we were one of the first people that started in this tabulation space. It was a type of computing we defined. And we had all kinds of... of uh, of crazy tools. In fact, there was even, I think, uh, meat slicers and others that were in IBM's background, right? Well, that was an important machine at some point in time. But the issue with it was that, that it was brittle and that you couldn't build different machines to do everything that you wanted to, to accomplish. So, so somebody had an idea, right? They said, how about we, instead of building a machine to do everything we want, we build machines that we can tell them what we want them to do. Right? We build systems that you can program, you can give instructions to, you can say, this is what we would like to have you do today, and, and that moves forward. It was on a um, uh, type of architecture that was written up in a paper in about 1945 um, by uh, von Neumann that said, this is how we want to connect programmable systems together. And IBM built the first system. What was a big bet for us was we, we bet the company on saying we're going to build a, a system. It was called the System 360 at that time. It was the first computer that didn't just do what it was built to do. It was built to do what you told it to do. right? And it would take instructions. And it would go through and have information that you could, you could tell uh, what to do today. It, if you go back, every computer we have, you, you guys have some kind of mobile phone or some device, something like this? They're all the same. There's been no material change in computers since then. They got faster, they got smaller, 
right? You can tell them a few more things to do. But fundamentally, everything you have, everything that you're using, you can connect them over the internet. It's the same computer. Code language has changed. How they work changed. Oh, but there's some interesting examples. At that time, we started working with um, different insurance agencies to say, how do we build systems that you can program that can help run uh, scheduling or, or run insurance transactions? And they can adapt as you change transactions. Um, we built some technologies at that time that were called uh, uh, IMS, or KICS, right, were the names of these, these transaction-based systems. They're still running today. The same systems have been running for 50, 60 years, right, in major banks and institutions around the world, because they were the robust way that we saw this whole era of computing work. So what, what was interesting about that is this was something that for, for IBM, we started and found a way to think about programmable systems and starting it. And, and, but what was fascinating wasn't what we did, it's how that shaped an industry. You wouldn't have had PCs if you didn't have programmable computers. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have mobile devices if there weren't programmable computers. You wouldn't have all these languages and next generations. You wouldn't be having apps that now everybody can write and, uh, and put out if you didn't have programmable systems. It wasn't something that, that we did, right? It was something that we saw the beginnings of an industry and everybody took care of. I mean, could you live without, without computers today in any way, right? That type of programmable system has, has pervaded what we're doing in our lives and has become the foundation for everything. We think about business problems and business issues in terms of how we can solve them with different systems today. So massive, massive step forward. So my contention is we're at the beginning of now the first time since you know, the 1950s of a new kind of system. Right? And I, I call these systems cognitive systems. And, and what do I mean by this? So if a, if a programmable system is you program, you tell what to do, you give instructions and you do it, cognitive systems, you don't exactly tell what to do. Um, they learn. Right? They learn how to think. Uh, they take uh, classes, they, they do homework. They get their homework graded. Right? So they learn much more like how my kids learn, right? where I'll give it some problems, I'll give it some practice sets, it gets some right, it gets some wrong, I grade it. Right, um, does much better than I do usually, but you grade it, right? And when it takes a lot of examples of these graded's back, and it figures out, it figures out how did I get some right, how did I get some wrong, and it it will reverse engineer its way to be smarter, like you do. Somebody, uh, Professor O'Rourke, gives you plenty of feedback on on your writings or the papers you're putting in place, and you start to get the sense of how do I have to get this right. He doesn't tell you how to write the next paper. He just tells you this was wrong, this is some directional things to think about, and you, on your own, put that together and figure out what to do next. There's no instructions, there's no step-by-step -step write this, right? That's how all of us learn. That's how everything we do, uh, we learn. I'll give you a good, a good example um, of, of systems of how we think um, as we go forward, so you can, you can start to put these in place yourself. But what this allows us to do when you get systems that think and that learn and that grow is you don't get bounded by having to figure out all the answers ahead of time, figure out how to program the different rules. You find ways that the systems can grow and, and learn by experience. I think this is gonna be huge. So I'll go and give you some examples of what it is and, and how it means, but if you can start to think that we are at the, you know, we are 1% down the path of having learning systems, but they're now starting to be real, and we're gonna start to see an entire industry around it. So, um, if you look at this picture, I think about, about cognitive computing as being learning systems that augment human cognition. They help us scale and go faster in what we can perceive in the world, in what we can, and how we reason, and in how we relate to each other and, to, the, and, and um, to systems in general, in a completely different way. So if I think about you know, what you perceive, I, I want... I want systems that see what I see. And what do I see? When I look at a person, I don't just hear their words, right? I see their facial expressions. I see their tone. Um, if I know someone long enough, I start to know their personalities, right? And I know what they're, what they're like. Um, two different people can say the exact same things, and I know that they, they have two completely different meanings. Because we have learned, based on our experience, when people are sarcastic, when they're not, when they're angry, when they're mad, how to deal with them. And that's all learned, right? I don't think you ever read a book that said, when you deal with an angry person, say this to them. Well, I don't know. Did anybody read that book? I haven't. 
But you learn that. We go through enough experience that we start to understand it. So the first thing to be able to be able to learn from it, you have to understand, you have to perceive that you're dealing with an angry person or a happy person or someone who just had a, a really significant event in their life. Um, you need to be able to understand that just happened, right? Not just be flat in interpreting things that come in. So being able to perceive at a different level uh, matters. Second one is reasoning, different types of reasoning. So in these cognitive systems, um, they can go and address questions that don't have direct answers. So they think about um, what is the best type of, type of, uh, of cancer treatment for this individual patient? It's not written down. There's no answer. You can't go find the answer to say this is exactly what to do. Um, information changes all the time. What you can do is you can start to figure out probabilities very dynamically by reading everything that's out there and understanding what the opportunities are and sharing, here's a, here's a probability of how I would rank a, a few different possible things to work through. So they reason this way. What's important is they tell you why. They tell you why they reason, right? You can go uh, search internet information. You can go run different programs saying you'll get answers. So you can almost get answers for anything you want to find. But you don't see why. You don't get the rationale behind it that allows you as a person to actually make some decisions. Augment your thinking because it's saying, hey, I'm considering A, B, and C, and here's why. So if you can start to find systems that don't just give you output, but they can talk to you and explain why they have output, uh, that matters a lot. I relate this to my teams, right? You guys will have this a lot on the teams I'm sure you're running. I ask them questions all the time, right? What should I do in this market? Which clients should I go after? Well, should I build this or that or the other? And how unbelievably dissatisfying would it be if our whole conversation was, uh, you know, what should, I, what should I build today next? And you said, build this. And you just sat there. I mean, should I say, sure, right? And then I go invest you know, tens of millions of dollars to go build one, right? I want to go deeper. I want to go to the why. Why are you thinking about this? How do you, uh, what's the logic that you put in place? How did you consider all these other things? And, and that's what cognitive systems start to do with their reasoning. They don't just give you answers, they tell you why. And they help you connect and identify areas that you can explore. So um, I'll give you an example a little bit later about something we just announced yesterday with a, uh, maybe Wednesday, with the New York Genome Center about helping, um, helping people understand and discover new relationships between genetic mutations and the impacts on different pathways and how drugs can have impacts on them. Not showing them information that they, they've seen before, but starting to connect dots in a way that hasn't happened. A third one here about how they relate. So I've personally change the way that I'm speaking and change my tone and change my demeanor depending upon who it is that I'm talking to, right? If, if uh, you know, I'm talking to my kids, if I'm talking to my boss, right? If I'm talking to different clients, how you relate, it's not even what their role is, but who they are as individuals. And it gets very important for us to know how do you speak. I'm sure you speak differently to your friends uh, on spring break, late at night, uh, than you do when you're on stage in uh, you know, Dr. O'Rourke's class, right? So nobody's told you how to do that. You've learned what the right customs are, right? You've learned in that different area, this is sort of acceptable and how to communicate. E even amongst your friends, right? If you really think about it, you probably use different words to different people and you talk a little bit differently. And that's you know, the art of communication is that type of personal relationships. So, uh, so I think that's one of the third things we see here. And then finally, all of these are about learning. The, these systems aren't just about how we perceive and what we can reason and how we can relate, but that they learn and get better. So our goal is to get them good enough that they are out of kindergarten. And once they're out of kindergarten, they can start learning and they can go faster and faster. But their pace at how much they can start picking up new information is, is dramatically faster. They can now go through all of the things that it takes us years to go through and minutes and days to go help us uh, work more creatively and come up with better ideas. So these are the kinds of systems that we're, we're talking about today. And we're just at the cusp of, of where they're starting. I'll give you a few examples of the types of things that are happening just to frame it from you. So in this perception area, and thinking about systems that perceive the world differently, um, we've started to find, this doesn't show up terribly well from your screen, does it? Looks really good on mine. Um, but this top picture is a picture of 
uh, starting to pick up visions. This is a medical sieve. It's looking at um, actual images directly. What you and I would do, right? We would pick up images and be able to look at them and understand what's happening. So we're starting to use technology to perceive what's happening in images and in scans uh, directly as opposed to having to have someone else look at it for us and give us information so that we can put that in front of someone and help them make a different decision. This middle one, which is uh, a little hard to see, is a, um, is a psychographic profile. So we start to now look at a person and not just understand about them in terms of you know, what's their demographics, their age, their gender, their location, their you know, basic information by that, but based on how they speak, based on how they talk, who are they? What's their personality and their, their psychographic dimensions? Because that tends to matter. Knowing that about people allows you to uh, make a different uh, determination of how you're going to respond to them and react. So it's taking much deeper information from it. So that's the very beginnings of some of the things we're seeing right now, but are about perceiving the world around us in a materially different way. I thought reasoning was, was uh, an interesting one. So. Initially, we start in this reasoning area on things like uh, questions and how could you find answers to questions, and, and it was a very basic set of, of reasoning. What we've started doing now is pushing that to other levels. How do we find inferences right, where there isn't an answer there, but I want to start connecting dots. I mean, how many of the questions that, that you and I deal with today do we not have a direct answer to, but I need to infer what might be the right next steps to, to work on? Um, and I need to go and weigh pros and cons. If I'm going to do an acquisition, I need to decide what are the pros and cons of this acquisition. And most of the ones that you might look at in your, your careers, nobody's written a report that says, here's the pros and cons of this. Right? You have to be able to have systems that can help you weigh those articles, weigh those arguments very quickly. Um, in fact, I saw a demonstration of this just the other week. It was a little bit of an interesting time because I was with a number of, of uh, CEOs in uh, London and the team who was doing this, this one system that was showing debates on arguments said, let's ask it some interesting questions. And they started to ask it in downtown London, um, uh, should we abolish the monarchy or not? It's a slightly sensitive question for being in downtown London. And I have no idea what it's going to say, right? And so you know, the system's reading through all this information, and it came up with all these pros and cons for how you would evaluate the argument of whether or not it was a good idea to evaluate, uh, to abolish the monarchy in London. Um, I was glad, at first I was just glad it had answers on both sides, right? It had found both, because that could have gone dramatically wrong if, if it was the wrong way. But what was interesting about it is that, that type of insight where you know, the system had gone through and read and learned and started to look through lots of things and it didn't give you an answer. It helped you organize and think through a problem and give you pros and cons on something that came from, put together from a lot of different places. That was really powerful if you think of all the opportunities of where that comes in. Every, every deal you're going through to be able to look at what's the better and worse sides of this deal. And they asked it the question and it gave you an answer like a second in a second, it like read through everything, and then it told me these pros and cons of, this, the, of these different arguments. So that's a completely different type of reasoning um, than what we've been thinking about before. And it helps us figure out what information is out there and, and how we can apply that. So there's going to be lots of steps in these types of problems and reasons that, that I think we're going to see these cognitive systems be able to do uh, for us. And then the last side is relating. How do we talk back and forth and speak to... Uh, to each other. So we have started to move from um, how we communicate and find out what's the best message to say to someone. Right? That's, that's sort of programmatic technology. You find a bunch of different types of communications or messages or answers you give to people, and you can sort of group people into categories and decide which of these five ways to answer them do I give them the message. Um, useful, right? But that's not how we communicate. We communicate by talking to an individual and actually picking the words that we know relate to them uh, very well, right? And that's going to be different. So we have been, uh, in, in this space, starting to find ways that we're now personalizing communication. Don't pick a communication from a list. Take a general concept or a general idea and tell it to you in the way that you will relate to it best. You'll get it. It makes sense to you. It's how you speak. It's, it's your, uh, your idea, and do it dynamically. So on the fly, as you're having these types of interactions, we can now get much more precise 
on understanding how you speak and how you communicate and, and relate back to you in that way. So again, huge opportunities for where that, that will take us. And all of these things continue to grow and learn over time. So we'll get all of them to a point of starting, um, but the, the excitement of what we move to is, is how they learn and how they, how they grow from that. So I thought it would be, it would be fun to do a little uh, experiment. So an experimental question someone gave to me for just how, how things learn. Let me ask you guys a question. If I took uh, Julius Caesar and I asked you guys what kind of method of transportation Julius Caesar drove, first, anybody know that answer definitively? That's good. So give me some types of things you think Julius Caesar might have, have used for transportation. Just yell it. Horse? Chariot? Chariot. What was that? Elephant? OK. But what's the thing called you carry around on your shoulders right and ride in? Yeah, I don't know. I'd like to have one of those someday. That would be awesome. OK, lots of different ideas. Great. I'm going to throw one back at you guys. Uh, Julius Caesar drove a Ferrari. Yes or no? No? OK, he didn't drive a Ferrari. Why? Why didn't he drive a Ferrari? That's way too quiet. They weren't invented then. Unfortunate, unfortunate. It's too bad for him. Good answer, though. Everybody think that's right? He didn't drive it. You guys, you guys all feel pretty confident he didn't drive a Ferrari, and it's because they weren't invented yet, right? OK, erase that from your minds for a second. I want you to yell out three reasons Julius Caesar seems like the kind of guy who would have driven a Ferrari. He's Italian. <laughs> He's rich. Need for speed. Ego. So you guys just told me a whole bunch of things that you yelled out about why this guy seems like the kind of guy who would have driven a Ferrari. You gave me way more of why he wouldn't have than he would. But you're pretty positive he didn't, right? Because you have learned. Did anyone tell you, did you read a book that said if stuff didn't exist, it's probably not the right answer? How'd you know that? He knew it from experience, right? He learned that when things didn't exist a lot of times, it probably were bad answers, right? So I'm going to make the question a little harder. That was a, little, that was a warm up. So do you think Julius Caesar likely drove the Ferrari of chariots? These are just coming fast. Just yell. Do you think he drove the Ferrari of chariots? Yes. yes. OK. Do you think he drove the Ferrari or the Hugo of chariots? No. For, which one, Ferrari or Hugo? Ferrari, okay, good. Do you think he drove a Ferrari or Lamborghini of chariots? I don't know. You have no idea, right? Did, did, you, did you have any experience of how to tell from you know, powerful Italian dictators which type of dramatic sports car they would have really liked? You have none. Could he have driven the Ferrari or the Rolls of chariots? You, you probably don't know that either, right? I mean, you might. You might have conjectures and reasons, but you're like starting to debate that. But you have people that if I asked you about that you know of your friends, could you tell which of your friends, if they were given the choice between the Ferrari and Rolls of Chariots, they would drive the Rolls or the Ferrari? I certainly know of my friends. I can, right? So you get experience. None of this is taught, but you have learned how to weigh a whole bunch of things, where it exists, geographic, time, money. You came up with a whole bunch of things that helped you figure out how to weigh this. And because of your experience, over time, you've done this enough that you realize, I don't care if all of them suggest he would do it, except for this one thing about experience, if the experience thing, if, if the, if the uh, existing issue you know, was there, if it wasn't invented yet, everything else doesn't matter. It's not right. That's how cognitive systems start to learn, right? They actually evaluate possible answers on, on how you could solve problems or what would be pros and cons or how do we look at inferences. They evaluate all of the possible responses a lot of ways, hundreds, thousands of different ways they factor in to look at them. And their experience then tells them as they go through and get, get better and better, they learn how to get more precise so that the way they think is more often right than wrong. I don't tell them what to think. I don't tell them rate this one highest first. I don't tell them to go through and do these, these statements one at a time. I explain to them. Uh, they, they learn the types of thinking, and they figure out, how do I weigh it so that I get more answers right than wrong as we go? That's, that's sort of how cognitive systems go. So what's powerful about that is if you've met one guy, and uh, you, know, you only have that experience, you'll have a point of view. right? You have a point of view of, of who those people are. 
You know, I'll, I'll leave here and for better or worse, probably worse, you'll have an opinion of what people who work for IBM are like. I apologize. But if you meet all the other people, you will see they are much better and cooler and they know what they're talking about and they're more interesting. So you're going to leave with one opinion, but if you meet a lot more, you'll come up with a different opinion, right? So this is how we go it and drive things. We, when we put cognitive systems to work, they will start to have their like little finite starting opinion. But what's great is because they can go fast, because they can go and interact uh, with a lot of people quickly, they can quickly get to a million opinions. That's cool, right? Because now I can start to scale and share that information back and forth as we go. So I think that's going to be the, um, where we see this. And, and we are at the like, absolute beginning of this space. If, if you think about the types of relationships we have right now, um, you know, we might have started by th with things like questions and how do you talk to people and personalize the discussion. I think we're getting into how do we experiment with uh, empathy and how and humor and other ways that you can change the relationships that um, make what you how you interact more relevant. I mean, these are really crucial conversations for how we relate to each other. They're also helping how people relate. If you think about the reasoning, um, we want to go from being able to come up with ideas to synthesizing, creating new ideas. Uh, you know, what are the top risks for me if I want to go? acquire this new company? It's not, there's no answer to it, right? I need to read a bunch of things and come up with a piece of analysis that puts together top risks and show why. I can't find it anywhere. I need to synthesize it from a bunch of different spots. And this is going to keep going from, from here to conjecture. We're just starting to hit some experiments where you're having systems create ideas, right? New ideas that, that haven't been ideas that were there before for you to evaluate but that they can help put in front of you to help inspire you in a different way. I'm going to show you an example of that one in a second. And then um, from perceiving, from language and what people say into their, their personalities and who they are, and then the, the attitudes that they have overall, and, and how can you relate that. So this entire spectrum, for all of you, for 50 years, is going to keep growing. And so there's going to be opportunities across the board to, A, uh, leverage what's out here and take advantage of it in the way you interact with customers and the way that you solve problems and the way you analyze really big issues. But it's also going to create opportunities for you to go create new ways that systems can, can work and can uh, be applied in different spaces. Huge opportunities. So if creating programmatic computers created an entire industry about um, building them, bless you, uh, I think creating cognitive systems will now create an entire industry. In fact, one of the key areas for us is we had thought about, should we just kind of keep this in the labs and keep working on it forever? And we've moved to saying, oh, we want to open this up. We want to go and, and build apps, let people start to push the technology here for where they see it going. Because this isn't, this isn't about a company. This is about what all of us do as an industry. In fact, um, uh, we had a group of interns last summer, at least two of whom were from, IB, uh, from Notre Dame. And, and they were the first group ever to try to build an app uh, on top of Watson um, that was not people with PhDs in machine learning and natural language processing and all these other areas. So, so it was fun. So you should know this now, right? If you didn't know, right? But if um, when you have interns coming to work for you, you can ask them to do things, and if you say it with a straight face, they'll believe it's possible. So you know we had these we had these you know uh, eight or so people and when we said okay you guys have maybe it was thirteen people we had eight or so people we said you guys have about twelve weeks you should just see if you can build an app that's going to do this and uh, have it running before the end of the summer and you know that's good we'll catch you guys later nobody had ever done that before <laughs> we didn't have any tools for them there were no instructions there was a, we said just go figure it out right and uh, you know. Maybe to our surprise and to you know, their excitement, they did it, right? And they were able to start getting the basics of how do I take something and get it put in place and, uh, and drive it. And the business leaders that were on that project were both Notre Dame um, students. So it was really good. It was really exciting. We learned so many lessons of how hard we made it for them. But again, that's what your interns are for, right? They push all kinds of awesome boundaries for you. So huge opportunities, I think, in this space uh, for you guys to go out and, uh, and, and drive new things and, and really push the future. So that's cognitive computing. That's where I think we're going to go. That's how I think the technology evolves. So technology evolving is 
to me, super interesting. To most people, not terribly interesting. So what I'm talk about is what's the impact of that and what's it going to mean for, uh, for you? So three areas that I'll bring up here. One is about the speed and scale that all of us are going to be empowered to think. Right? That's, that's the first place I want to really talk through. The second one that I think is uh, less obvious is going to be how this drives creativity. I think there's something really powerful here, right, in terms of how we come up with new ideas, um, which are not things we traditionally ask, you know, your computers to be the most creative thing for you. But I think if you can really push the boundaries and draw some connections in a different way, we'll actually see a lot of innovation and creativity spurred forward by these systems throwing ideas in front of us that we wouldn't have come up with on our own. And it's not answers, it's ideas, it's sparks of new things for us to go and, and build on that help us be more creative. So I think that's going to be fascinating. And then the last one is empowerment. Um, one of the reasons I came over to take this role after being in the Smarter Cities role, which was a, a phenomenally powerful and, and valuable experience, was because I started to see things like the digital divide and, and saw how different it was for those of us who are completely connected and only shut our cell phones off when we're on stage um, to everybody else, right, who is not, and, and what that gap could create. And I saw this as an opportunity to, to move that forward. So I want to give you guys some examples, because I think these will, will apply to all of you. So first, uh, this is scary to me, right? That, um, and this is probably now a year old or so stat, so it's probably even worse. But that 90% of the world's data was created in just uh, the last couple of years. Like of, now you might ask, what were they doing for the rest of the thousands of years until like two years ago that they started to like do work, right? But apparently, you know, the, the pace at which we can bring in information, not just things that, that we have in companies, but voice and, and the types of social data that's out there and these sort of second order things, we are exploding the amount of information. Take a really specific case, right? On As we've been sequencing the human genome, we now start to find more and more levels of detail about people that we can learn about. And, and if you think about how fast that's growing and how fast people are going to be publishing and writing and coming up with new information on not just how each gene is different and what the impacts are, but how combinations of, of genes and mutations have, have different impacts on people, it is vast. Nobody can keep up with it. Um, so, so if you see this type of speed at which information is moving, if you can't personally sit down and read all of that, right, you can't be an expert in your area. It, it's too hard now. It's, it's become impossible. I, I was at um, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in, in New York City uh, earlier this week. Those guys were amazing. Right? I, I work with both of them, and I work with MD Anderson in, in Houston, Texas. And, and in those two places, you have some of the smartest, most dedicated, uh, complete specialized people you've ever seen. And they are keeping up with and pushing the edge of this, this uh, technology and these mutations faster than you can, uh, you can imagine. And if you see all these people producing more and more information, finding out the results, and you think about, what about the rest of us, right? What about everybody else who has to go find access to information? Isn't the people actually doing the research? How are you ever going to keep up with, with what's happening? Only way is if you can have something else that's helping make sense of it for you and, and helping you be able to put it into practice. So if you think about all that information, you think about the types of records that are out there, cognitive systems can read these in seconds. And it's not just that they know what the words are, right? There's lots of things that can know what the words are and could find one for you if you wanted to type in a keyword and say, show me the document. That's, that's great. What they want to be able to do is uh, understand it for you. So find meaning in these. Find out what, what's possible here, what's being said, what's the, what's the substance of it. If you find that there's a whole bunch of different articles about a BRAF4 mutation, you don't want to read them all. You don't have time to read them all. You need something to go read them for you and tell you what's the impact, right? So, so that's the path that we see as these systems get broader and broader. The, the ability to look at them individually has to scale. So there's some really clustered maps over here. Again, I apologize, aren't showing up terribly well. But what you're seeing on the top uh, right is a 
picture of a sequence data for an individual person. And it's showing where there are mutations and where there are connections for a, um, uh, on a particular, particular piece of sequencing information. And we're getting better and better at finding all these types of mutations that are happening today. The problem is figuring out what to do with them now that you have this great set of sequencing and you know where all these mutations are, well, which, which ones are things I can actually take action on or actionable because there is something that I can do to target it? And how does the combination, all the possible combinations have an impact? You'd have to read everything. So we had uh, Watson read 23 million different articles about information that's coming in, it reads new ones as new ones come in, so that it can start drawing connections and identifying pathways, uh, which is what this lower picture looks like. So you can see the relationship between different mutations and the treatments that they have and how they're, they're being applied. And so it's not picking that up one by one, it's actually going through millions and millions of pages and in seconds, I mean, the doctors, teams of doctors spend weeks combing through to figure out how to find what to do for a patient today. That's the state of the art at the best places, right? That they're going through and spending a lot of times to find that information. And, and the amount of information that they even have is just starting. It's a completely unscalable model. So with systems that can read and that can understand and make use of it for you, not just find documents to put in front of you and say, be really awesome if you could read these 150 documents in the next two minutes, um, but actually apply that for you, you now have the ability to get each of us the types of uh, treatment and ideas um, based on what's very unique about us. That's the only way that this, this is gonna scale, to give a physician that type of information to make a, a case. So that's the first one. Second one was, was creativity, accelerating innovation. Did any of you guys see, um, see the South by Southwest uh, food truck story? I guess it was last week. You did? You're, you're probably busy on your own spring breaks, somehow doing something more interesting than that. Um, but let me show you a quick, it's probably a minute or two clip of what we were doing um, last week. What I want you to take a to notice as you watch this quick clip is the people that are talking here are chefs. These are professionally trained Culinary Institute chefs. Very good, right? They do not need a better cookbook, right? Everybody, they can get, they can cook anything that's out there. They're creating what are the next types of recipes that are going to be, uh, that are going to be, you know, phenomenal going forward. That's not what they need. They, so what we tried to do was show how could Watson read a whole bunch of recipes, not give them to the chefs because that would be not very useful for a Culinary Institute trained chef, but how can it start to find taste profiles and, and new relationships about food and food taste so it can recommend to a chef, you should try putting these things together, right? They haven't been put together before, but um, take a look and see what, what happened. Finally, tonight it was probably only a matter of time before a computer was enlisted to come up with new food combinations to expand our culinary horizons. For generations, it was people like Julia Child who led the way. Now, it's Watson. NBC's Katie Turr explains. It's good. I do like it. And I would go back for a second. On this rainy afternoon, people are lining up for a so small plate of fish and chips. Plantain chips. But this is not your traditional comfort food. We're getting rid of the frying and the fish and chips. And this is no ordinary food truck. That's because working alongside the chefs from the Institute of Culinary Education is Watson. And you may remember Watson, IBM's famous computer program, as the Jeopardy champion that crushed the game show's top players back in 2011. Well, engineers have since tweaked the program to not only recall data, but to think creatively. To get here, Watson digested more than 35,000 recipes from around the world, learning the flavor profiles and chemical compounds that taste good in order to generate new combinations never attempted before. This is stringing together five, six ingredients at a time that are all matched based on the flavor compounds that they share. That's, that's something that's way beyond you know, my ability as a chef. And the results have been described as both strange and wonderful. There's the Belgian bacon pudding with bacon, heavy cream, and figs, the Austrian chocolate burrito with apricot, edamame, and cheese, and the Vietnamese apple kebab with curry, strawberry, and shiitake mushrooms. I would never have thought in a million years to pair strawberry and mushroom together. The system allows us to virtually taste them first. Sorting through big data for new ideas. It's a prospect that captured the imagination 
of the folks at IBM. So this is really what we think of as the future of computing. Um, and this is going to transform industries and create new markets. Now all they have to do is figure out how Watson can make his cake and eat it too. Katie Turr, NBC News. So what do you think? In, who wants strawberries and mushrooms now for lunch? You're going to get that? So the interesting idea was not putting these recipes out, right? That's not hard to do. There's lots of ways to do it. But how can we have something help learn and get feedback and, and inspire where we go next so that we can come up with new ideas? So these are great chefs. So Watson didn't finish this saying, put a quarter teaspoon of this in with a half a teaspoon of that. That's not what it did, right? Again, these are chefs. The idea was to go inspire them, and it said, mix this set of things together in this style. So you could come and say, I want... Uh, you know, Vietnamese, well, what did they have? I want Vietnamese food based on, you know, um, on apples or something, right? And, and, and if you kind of said, this is sort of the flavor I'm in the mood for, the, the type of cuisine I'm in the mood for, this is a taste, I'm going to start to find interesting ways to put these together that um, would be useful. And so these chefs, who are experts, right, are not uh, get, being told everything that they have to do. What they're getting is inspired into a new path that takes them someplace that they would not have gone down that path before. I think that's really going to be compelling for all of us, right? Not how uh, we end up building actual answers all the way through, but how we help inspire them. So the reason I'm showing you these things is, is not that uh, I'm trying to advertise a particular technology or make you all love Watson, right, as much as I do. Um, but because I think the potential for where these go and, and what they can do for us, we're just seeing the beginnings of them. And, and I want you to, to be able to take away, if this is the kind of inspiration you're getting in something that was you know, relatively simple and basic to put forward, where, does it, where do we take it? Where's it going to go in 10 years? Where's it going to go in 20 years? And, and I think it's going to be in a very materially different place. And all of you will be the ones who shape this, right? Because you'll be the ones who are driving the, the industry as we go forward. OK, so that was two. First was speed and scale. Second was creativity. Third is blacked out. And it is empowerment, right? So I think what gets very interesting when you start to be able to have uh, systems do some of this work for you, you can bring all kinds of people into decisions that, that weren't there. Um, I start off because I think a lot. We, we did another announcement with uh, building a center in Africa um, that, that was trying to help be able to use things like texting and collect information. There's been lots of ways that people have used texting before, which is a good method of communication for major parts of the world. But take it to be able to let you find information through texting the way you do through the internet, right? Where you know to make that work, you need to be able to not send people to web pages to look at, because that would be atrocious over texting, right? You need to be able to read information on behalf of the person and come out with the types of answers and feedback dynamically. And it's got to be pointed, right? You can't give them a lots to go through. You have to help give them answers. And it's got to fit in something you're going to text back and forth. So the only way to do that is to have something that can do the work for you and actually read it. If you can do that, you take a group that has this method of communication and empowers them to now be connected in a different way. Not just, right now people are doing banking by text, right? Brilliant, brilliant. It's completely changed the world for some of the personal finances of, of people in these regions. But if we can start to infuse knowledge and empowerment into those same channels, you change the game. I'll give you another example. Let's take, um, let's take a more first world problem. Take things like wealth management. Um, there's a heck of a lot more people that don't have their money under advisement than that do. Why is that? It doesn't make, it's not economically making sense right now, right? You have, you have millions of dollars. It's great. You can go get a personal advisor to take care of your money and help invest it for you and get you a return. If you don't, it's not worth their time and it's not worth the effort to be able to track that. However, what's the, what's the virtuous cycle if you can bring the, that money, if you can bring everybody's you know, money into the market to be managed uh, in an appropriate way because you can figure out how to scale some of that advice. People do better, right? They get better returns on their own money and they can save better for their futures. Uh, there's more money in the market driving innovation and growth. The companies that can do it find ways to grow and differentiate. Everybody wins if you can figure out how to scale some of that. 
So it doesn't take the people who are having experts that are with them every day and, and, and are the, the high end of that market that's doing really well. It's now bringing a whole bunch of us who are not in that same market and bringing us into it. So it's empowering and getting people into doing things that they haven't done to date. And, and I think that's really powerful for, for where we see this going. Uh, all the places where things are not happening today that you could drive in because of the ability to interact in a, in a different and more powerful way. So those are the three areas that I, I see on um, how we can work in a different type of speed and scale, how we can work uh, creatively in a different way, and how we can bring into the market a whole bunch of things that are today not happening because we just can't figure out how to, how to reach the people the right way. So let me uh, conclude with a, a couple areas about opportunities for the future. So if you are leaders, business leaders, um, foundation leaders, organization, organizations going forward, I, I want you to start by thinking about how do I empower my teams? Um, I was just talking uh, with, with the dean right before this, and we were talking about the new business analytics program that's being started. You know what's really interesting? Um, one of the ways we've just started experimenting with now is something we, we call Watson-based analytics. And, and the power of it is uh, I'm not an analytics person, right? I don't write lots of statistical models, but I've got lots of analytics questions. And so we're in the process right now of building systems that you can talk to, but will give you analysis back. So what if you had a system that you just say, how's my business doing this year compared to last year? Bang, pops up and shows you a graph. What happened if I looked at that across the different countries? It shows you a different graph. How are my products doing in each? It shows me a different graph. It keeps building analytics for you. You're not typing anything. You're not modeling things. You're speaking to it and saying, this is what I want to do. If everybody in your organization can do that, you're in a pretty powerful spot right? on how fast you can move, how agile you can be, and you've connected these, these pieces. So think about your teams and how you can empower them. Second one is how do you engage customers? I mean, everybody has, has shifted to, to, um, to mobile lately. In fact, a lot of the clients that I talked to are talking to me because their customers who used to come in and talk to them all the time and that they had relationships to have now gone completely mobile in their channels. And what is great about it is they're really good transactional, right? They buy stuff, they, they move things forward. But now they have no relationship anymore because they don't, they don't talk, they don't give advice, they don't ask for things. It's just another way of, of uh, you know, making a transaction, which makes the relationship not very strong. So they want to figure out how do I infuse that transactional channel with something that can be more, uh, more inspiring and more uh, advice giving as it goes forward. So that's, that's the second one. And the last one is this should reinvent entire industries. This is new ways to look at risk. This is new ways to look at reward, new ways to figure out where growth possibilities are. Uh, I talked to one phys uh, physician who was doing research on, on cancer treatments, again, the place we started. So um, he said what it had taken them years to do before, he would now be able to, to put together in months, right? Uh, in some cases, someone told us there was a piece of research they did that took them over a year to do that when they started using Watson for it, it took them two days, right? And, and what was interesting about it was to see the, the uh, passion that they had, because they're in these missions to drive research you know, it's not an entirely financial goal. Their goal was to improve humanity and save lives. And we said, you can go in this much faster if something can help you do the tedious and hard parts of that work and present the information to you in a way you can make decisions. It completely changes the way they can move forward. So really think about where those, those opportunities are. For entrepreneurs, there's going to be a lot of places that you can go create new companies, either taking advantage of these or um, building out new, new cognitive-like capabilities. I think this is going to return for us more than the you know, internet boom did when we had that most recently a decade and a half ago. Right? This is going to be a whole industry that gets created, and the value and the problems we're going to be able to solve will be dramatic here. So there's a huge opportunity to invest in that and take advantage of what will be this next transformative era that, that's going to have a significant amount of, of uh, legs to it. And finally, for, for research, you know, I'd really like to see people pushing the boundaries. Where do, we, where do we go next, and how do we take this to another level that's going to be meaningful? All across different types of perception, different types of reasoning than we've thought about before, ways to relate and interact, and, and then really starting to see this um, being collaborative. So we've tried to think about how a whole community can develop up that supports each other, because I think the ideas are 
are uh, really powerful. It's been fascinating to talk with some of the clients and, and partners I have and where their heads are. And you know, they've got many more fantastic ideas than I do. And so getting them engaged, getting them working together as much as they're, they're uh, working directly with us is where I think we see things moving a lot faster. So with that, hopefully that was a, a little glimpse into you know, my world and where I see the next 10 years moving forward. Um, I think it's going to go much beyond 10 years. I think it's going to be a dramatic change. I think we'll look back and we'll say this was, you know, this was as transformative for all of us and what it meant for our businesses and our lives as it did when we were in you know, putting out the first computers and starting to automate different processes. So, so I hope you take from that and it gives you some ideas so that you can go forward and uh, inspires the future of the businesses you guys are in. Thank you. Do you want to say? Sure. Uh, I think I can take a few questions. Thank you very much for coming. Um, do you think that with the way the data is all being compiled in Watson that it's going to affect the things that we have to learn pre getting into industries? Yeah, it's, it's a, could you guys hear the question? So do you think it's going to affect the ways that we have to learn? I think it's going to be fascinating um, to see how we develop, right? As, as you start to develop higher order capabilities, it'll be interesting to see how do we learn and, and how do we think differently. I mean, I almost think about uh, how, was, how did you learn math before you had calculators, right? If you go back to the initial age, right? You, you just did things fundamentally differently. Um, we're going to change the way that that works now and how people learn. And these, these tools will be the calculators of, of the future. So we'll learn different processes and different ways to get more advanced. We got more advanced in math and more in physics and in engineering once we could put tools in place that took some of the other steps away from us. So it wasn't that we said what we were doing before, that's all we want to do now. And since that's, you know, we now found tools to take part of the hard parts away, we're just going to go on vacation the rest of the time. Right? We said, how do we keep now pushing the next envelope forward? So I, I see that very same thing happening here. Um, and that's what these researchers have been saying to us over and over again. The more you can help me push in innovation and drive in different spots, I'm going to go faster, and I'm going to have you know, larger, larger benefits that come out. So, so that's what I think we'll, we'll see as, uh, as we continue to have this uh, advance. Uh, very thank you for your presentation. It's a very interesting topic and very inspiring idea. Uh, just a question, continue from the previous question. You said, uh, you mentioned that uh, how Watson affect our life will be uh, how calculator, the innovation of calculator affect the way we learn math. But um, a different opinion I have is, I think because we have calculator, kind of weaken our power of some fundamental, uh, fundamental like calculation, and uh, weaken our power of some basic foundation we should have to learn math and learn some science. So, do you think because of Watson, it will like also weaken some of our uh, very fundamental ability to learn or to study to uh, interact with people? Like uh, obviously, what's going to have like a very positive effect on our life? But have you ever considered the negative effect? Like how that will weaken our life? Sure. So, so we're all about to run into a problem, right? That that data chart that's now dated, the dated data chart, um, says there's more than we can read the old way. Can't be done anymore. If it could, if our choice was. Do we want to continue doing something? Do I want to just read information, learn how to calculate things the old way that I did, run simulations the way I used to do manually, and that was the option for us? Um, you know, there'd be there'd be some value in continuing to do that. I think what we're actually seeing, though, is we've hit a point where that is now impossible. I'm talking to people who are absolute experts in their field, and they're throwing their hands up, saying, "I can't keep up." And I am the expert. Like, on the planet, I'm the expert. Not like I'm a pretty smart person who's OK with this. Like, I'm the smartest guy, and I can't keep up. right? And if that's what happens, then your two choices are either make everybody slow down, it's not bad, right? or figure out a way to go faster. And, and I think we're going to have to find some of those new ways to go forward, because that's going to be what, what transforms a, 
Because, and this is, this is part of the shift. I actually had a, one of our research guys had an interesting point, which is pocket is it? this one. So I was at a, a research meeting where we were talking about how this innovation was going and how things were moving faster. And he got to a point of saying, um, the, the pace at which we can now process is X number of, of calculations and processing things per second. He said, we now have a problem. We can go so fast that if you can do this many calculations in a second, how far do you think the speed of light moves in that much time? Well, the answer was like this far, right? So an, it, we can do a calculation in as long as it takes light to move this far. What's the issue with that? If you're actually, if your system is actually bigger than this, you're being held up by the speed of light. It's an unfortunate problem because your two options are make the speed of light go faster, right? All Higgs boson computers going forward, or get everything smaller than this, right? So we're talking about how to build data centers that are, that are like this. So I think the, the, like this size, so he actually pulled something out. We have this technology, someone is working on how can I get a data center into something about this big? And that'll get us, buy us a little bit of time till we get to the Higgs boson computing. But I think the, the point is, as we continue to advance, we have to figure out ways to keep up and to be able to advance. And these are now natural barriers for us that we're coming up against that are gonna require us to re rethink the problem. And, and I think we've come up with those time and time again in our history, and that's what we're gonna keep, keep doing. Hi, thank you for coming. I have a question of how you're gonna prevent the misuse of Watson, since it can reevaluate data all the way since Julius Caesar to now. And what if, say, for example, Hitler got its hands on Watson, and how do you prevent them from like taking over humankind? You know, I, I wonder how you prevent people from having cars like driving into walls, right, and just running over people on crazy rampages uh, after a bad football weekend. Um, virtually they don't happen that often, right? So, but, but I think part of what we're, we're doing, part of how this grows from a community is everything from governance to the insight about it is, is something that, uh, that everyone learns, right? And we're all gonna develop as, as we work on this one together. Um, so there isn't, by the way, um, I should make this distinction. I was trying not to talk too much about technology. It's just, it's hard sometimes. But there isn't a big Watson. Right, the very first Watson was one computer. Right, it was one big computer. It was the only one. It knew everything that it knew, and if you wanted to use it, you used it. This is now a type of technology, right? That is now available in the cloud. That now scales. People have different ones, access to different things. So there's no all-seeing, all-knowing individual computer. Right, we're talking about the types of of uh, cognitive functions around perceiving and relating and reasoning that you can now apply and put into. Uh, different spaces that are valuable for you. So I think two things are going to happen. One is we'll see this evolve in a space where um, individual problems are being solved, much the way individual computers and programmed computers solve different things in the past. And two, part of opening this up and having the whole industry think about it with us is huge opportunities for how do we help drive things like governance and, and control. Every, everything right now is opted in and, and driven based on what people want to do with them. And so that's something we'll continue to talk about as we go. I think it's gonna be an exciting conversation. There was somebody back there too. John, thanks a lot for the talk, really appreciate it. <clears throat> Question for you. You mentioned that um, you think cognitive computing is going to become a whole new industry for which Watson is the forerunner. So what do you think that means for the kind of future concept of singularity that people talk about and, and where that's gonna go and kind of the relationship between Watson and artificial intelligence for the future? So, um, when, you want a date for when the singularity happened? No. <laughs> no. Okay, good. But see, now you're reaching back to my philosophy degree days at, at Notre Dame, right? I can sit under a tree and have a beverage and talk about this for a while. Um, the, the short answer is I think we are a heck of a long way off, right? Really, really far. I, I get to work with these things every day, right? So when you come to a discussion about what 10 years hence is like, you can push the boundaries a little far. They're, they're like kindergartners right now. Right? When we talk about how much they're learning, it's really cool that we have kindergartners, and to see a kindergartner like learn what its colors are is pretty awesome. But that's that's where we are. We are dramatically far from where uh, we will grow and adapt and evolve over time. So I think we're going to build so many lessons as we go through and and develop these these uh, this industry together. 
that, um, that we're going to go out and, and be able to address these issues and we're going to think about you know, what do we want them to do? How do we want them to be driving and, and helping us, helping us augment what we're doing today? So I think we've got a long, long time to go. But what I'm excited about is we're at the beginning of now being able to start thinking about and solving problems that were really just beyond our means before. Hi, John. Um, I want to thank you for speaking to us today, but I, I have a question about Watson. Um, I think IBM's made it abundantly clear that Watson has enormous capabilities when it comes to decision making and uh, data analysis, but what I don't understand is why it hasn't achieved more widespread adoption yet, uh, when it seems like it's capable of doing so much. You, you know what, uh, what the first version of Watson did? Took seven word questions and gave you one or two word answers. So again, I told you at the very beginning, my job is to come in to take things that are interesting ideas and figure out how to make them really um, you know, compelling solution areas. So when we started and got involved in this, when you really broke down what was interested in Jeopardy, the focus there was on language, on an understanding language and really pinpointing, can you get subtleties, can you get puns, can you, can you put those in place? But the types of questions that we had to understand from them were, um, you know, finding pretty succinct answers out of things, and then throwing the words what is, who is, in front of it. But that was, that was where it was. So the first thing we spent time on was how do I go from, um, from something that has a really simple question to the much more uh, broad types of questions. So we went from taking a question that was Jeopardy, so what, seven, eight words, right? Now the healthcare questions that are going into Watson are probably 25 pages long. The question is 25 pages long, right? What do I do for this person given this history and family history and medical history and all this? Because that's a real world type of question, right? That's the, that's the complicated issues we solve today. They're not this, they're this. And, and that's where we wanted to focus. So we intentionally said, um, let's go see where we can, where we can test the, the output of it. The second part was the kind of responses you could get. So I could get very short responses back at the beginning. So now I can get responses that are phrases, that are paragraphs, that are graphs. And all of that was new invention that we've done. So our beginning, when I got, when I got into this, um, the team said, go figure out if there's something here. I don't know if there's something here or not, right? Go test it out. So they took a handful of us, um, we probably grew to a couple hundred by the end, and they hit us away from corporate. So no one would like ask us lots of questions about things. So we were headquartered in Austin, Texas, which is where I live, um, and and where it is actually warm enough to play golf this time of year, right? Um, so so I live in Austin, Texas. So we were we were there, and our goal was to figure out could we get this to a point that we saw the real technology that was broadly commercial. And so what it, what happened was we spent a couple years figuring out how far could we stress it. And we picked the hardest thing we could think about, which was this cancer research and treatment and care, intentionally. Were there easier things we could have done to go through? Absolutely. But we said, that's not going to help us stress test this as far as we need to go. And if it's not worth going anywhere, we just want to move on, right? So we spent that time going out and doing the work on, on um, some of the cancer research to get really complicated questions, much more detailed answers, things like what we did in the uh, New York Genome Center over the last, uh, last couple of years. And so then at the beginning of this year, we said, okay, this, is, this has legs. We've, we've proven what we were supposed to do to see is it valid, is there gonna be something real out of this, or is this something we should just move on from? So in January, we said, uh, we're gonna go invest a billion dollars into Watson. Um, we're gonna put a new headquarters uh, in New York. We're gonna build a, open it up to have ecosystem people on top of it to start building out, and we're gonna go and, and push pretty heavy to try and say that there is the foundation for an industry here. So certainly we could have finished that experimental phase and said, mm, didn't work. It's very good for what it does, and we will be the world's greatest trivia engine on the planet ever, which is like mildly interesting, maybe. maybe that might not even be mildly interesting to me. Um, but I think you know, what, we were able, what we were intentionally doing was seeing how far could we stress it. So this is now uh, from the test stage with Jeopardy and then the stress stage that we had in our startup mode. Um, this is now us sort of graduating from being a startup. I actually tell most people, I think I just got acquired into IBM even though I was already there. So it's a, it's a different pace that we're on right now. Okay. How can, 
Yeah, how can we get involved in developing applications for Watson? I believe the uh, ibmwatson.com uh, website, right, is the place to go through, and it will talk about two different developer groups and, and challenges that are in place for people to be bringing forth ideas and um, submitting them to get access to be able to develop their own apps. So our goal is throughout this year, we've got the first groups that have started and have already been writing applications on Watson, and we're kind of gradually opening that as we learn. So like we, had, we let the interns try it first and gave them nothing, and that was entertaining. And then, you know, now we've built from that experience, and we let the first few people try to go further. So we're, we're expanding that as we go so that uh, as it becomes broader and broader available, the experience of doing it becomes simpler and simpler. Sure. Do you see Watson within the foreseeable future as a kind of fee-based subscription service individuals could, so if I'm sitting in a car dealership and I say, given the price of this automobile and my current cash flow, should I buy or lease? Watson thinks it over and gives me an answer. How much do, do you guys want to charge Professor O'Rourke for that? Somebody's got a business right here, right? They can come to me afterwards and say, I want to build that. Right? So um, two things to that. Could you guys hear the question, by the way? The question was, how do you see Watson, I'm going to paraphrase, tell you if I how do you see Watson uh, being able to be released to consumers, making individual consumer decisions directly by themselves that they come in and, and take access to, more or less? So um, my view is twofold. First, the, the reason we had to go from one big computer to put it in a cloud is I want anybody to be able to develop on it. I want you to be able to go back to your dorm room and you know, in a handful of minutes start embedding cognitive capabilities into the apps that you want to write and then sell for a trillion dollars, right? That would be great. I hope one of you writes an app to sell to Professor O'Rourke the way so when he's in that car dealership and he's thinking about what are the pros and cons and how do I handle this particular area, you know, he can do that and you've got a subscription type of service to him. So I plan to put this in a, in a cloud to make it available to developers to build apps. What I intentionally don't want to do is write all of the world's apps, right? That would not, uh, first, I wouldn't be very good at it. And second, I, I think it would dramatically reduce the types of innovation we saw. So what I am hoping is somebody in here has written a great business model of how to make a, a lot of money off asking you for a little money but it makes your life better because it's going to drive a lot of uh, different decisions. And so my goal is to make uh, it very simple for you to be able to do that. So is this a fee per use sort of issue, kind of like the Apple <coughs> iTunes store, or do I get a bill from Watson like my Comcast bill once a month? Yeah, nice. So, so I think the, uh, the I, I really don't want to be compared to being a Comcast bill. Uh, <laughs> So I think the developers will have uh, usage-based subscriptions, right? Free to develop, play with it all you want while you're developing it. Usage-based as your customers use it, as you have use that comes in, there'll be different tiered pricing, direct pricing, uh, however that's set up so that so their charge. Their charging system to you can be varied, right? They can decide how they want to do it. They can package it up to you for a monthly basis so you're, you're paying a subscription to your car buying insight app if that's what you created, or you, you know, that's not a decision you probably do every month, so maybe you, know, you pay for it once, uh, and they're getting some aggregated amount to it. So their business model to you uh, can be different from mine to them, but what I'd like to do is make it very simple, usage-based, as you use it, you go through and you develop on it for free. Many organizations and companies need to get involved in the space. Could you share with us a few ideas or thoughts on other organizations or companies that are active in this space beyond just IBM? Or is it something that only, only IBM can, uh, has the capabilities to do? No, I, I think you're seeing it all over the place, right? I think as you know, there's lots of different groups that are starting to get into things like artificial intelligence even more, getting into research and... and um, ways to understand different information. There was a cool one yesterday that I saw that was about, uh, I think it was called WIT, right? But it was about talking to anything that was out there and being able to communicate and it would figure out what you meant and be able to start taking control of different areas. So I, I think we're, we're at a point where some of the ideas people have thought about in the past for automation, things that were, were, were sort of great concepts, but we weren't able to work fast enough to make them real, are now starting to become real. So we'll see this sort of 
um, dramatic growth across the industry of a number of places that are going to come up, hopefully from many of you. decide whose human mind is, is the best mind to pattern this after, oh. and, and how do you, uh, you know, what, because we all think differently, right? How do you decide who, whose human mind is that a good one? And I'm, I'm not, not necessarily I'm expecting an individual, but, but... Totally understand the question. It's a great okay. one. So, um, anyway, so I was a philosophy student. Did I mention that, right? So you take a philosophy class from somebody, it's a little less obvious how you have a right answer, right? You write papers, you write information about them. So whose mind do you get um, to decide if you're right or wrong? That professor's, right? Your training, you're, that one's person, they're gonna give you feedback. Now you take it from a bunch of different people and you start to get feedback from a bunch of folks and you do, then you sort of make up your own mind of how am I gonna sort of weave through the fact that all these different professors give me different points of views on what's right and wrong, right? So uh, Watson gets graded. You have to give it. You have to give it feedback, right? If if you're using it, you tell it that I like that experience. I not like that experience, and um, part of the experience that you that we drive is it learning how to how to collect feedback and, and work from it. So when we started, the reason we someone asked me earlier, it was it was an interesting conversation. They said, "Did you go work with really top uh, cancer researchers like at MD Anderson and Memorial Sloan Kettering?" because you just want to make them better, right, and separate how the best are better from, you know, you know everybody else, like try to push the top for it. And, and in fact, that had absolutely nothing to do with it. Our goal for all this cancer work is that everybody can use it. But we said, let's pick some people who are the deepest and most sub-specialized in their areas and let them give it feedback. Because if these are the people who know the most in the world right now, they're the people who, who I'd like to you know, be a fellow for, right, and get feedback from them as we go. So a lot of where we start is trying to find who do you let give feedback and who do you want to, to shape that as it goes. Now, as you expand, you can start to open up and, I mean, there's no technical reason why I can't let everybody have feedback on it and decide I like their opinions, right, and, and just amass it all as once and sort of crowdsource my way to a, a group that we're all happy with. But the real method is you know, who gives feedback right, as, as we go through it. And so that's something that I think, that I think grows. It's interesting, when we're doing these like, initial training sessions, we have really small groups that get to talk to it and give feedback. But as we open up, as they, they expand out in their projects, now I have thousands of people integrating and, and providing more feedback so I can use that as well. So it's a great question. I, I absolutely got where you're going. And it, and it is, you know, there, there is no final arbiter of right and wrong, right? They're, what it's trying to do now is figure out how do I learn the best way to, to solve within the constraints of um, the types of feedback I'm getting. Great. John, there are a couple of things here from the oh. bookstore. I'm Thank you. you don't already own. <laughs> Thank you very kindly for your Thank time. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>